Oh, no. Then I guess we should take it today. We should have reviewed last time and taken it today. So, we will take half of it Wednesday, half of it Friday. The test. We'll take half of it Wednesday, half of it Friday. What do you mean, how? How's that going to work? Like, isn't it on the computer? Yes. So it's 26 questions. I'll put 13 out on Wednesday and 13 out on Friday. How many questions I just got done saying there's 26 questions. So I'll put 13 out on Wednesday and 13 out on Friday. All right, here we go. We have a couple questions like this. If our function is x cubed plus 6x from 2 to 4, where does the instantaneous rate of change equal the average rate of change? What's this called? The mean value theorem. So to do the mean value theorem, what should you do first? Find f of 4. So 4 cubed is 64 plus 6 times 4 is 24. 64 and 24 make 88, correct? F of 2 is 8 plus 6 times 2 is 12, which makes 20. So then you go 88 minus 20 over 4 minus 2 equals 68 over 2, which equals 34. So the average rate of change is 34. So then you take the first derivative of this, which is 3x squared plus 6, and set it equal to the first derivative, the first deriv or the average rate of change, 34. Okay? And then if we subtract 6 from each side, 3x squared equals... 28 divided by 3. Ooh, this is an ugly number. Okay, so then x squared equals 28 thirds. If we take the square root, x equals the square root of 28 is the square root of 4, square root of 7, over the square root of 3. Multiply top and bottom by square root of 3. So it's 2 square root of 21 over 3. Now, what you should probably do is take the square root of 28 over 3 on your calculator. Somebody? 3 point something something. So it's in between 2 and 4, correct? So this would work. Now, is your test going to have ugly numbers like this? No. It'll have cuter numbers than... 2 square root of 21 over 3. Well, if you would have negative, does that go into this um, closed interval? The negative wouldn't be in that closed interval, so just the positive one would be. Okay? Yep, where the instantaneous rate of change equals the average rate of change if it happens within the interval and the function is differentiable throughout the entire interval, then it's the mean value theorem. We can look at it and see that there's not going to be any place between 2 and 4. It won't be. Mm. No, we didn't. <laughs> see, Bella, misses, Bella didn't laugh at that because she has no clue about what that comment meant about Leo. 
<laughs> All right. How many values would satisfy the mean value theorem in this case from negative two to three? Well, what does the mean value theorem say? Where the what equals the what? Average rate of change equals the instantaneous rate of change. The average rate of change from here to here is this. Okay. Can you understand that the average rate of change is this? From the end to the end, okay, that's the slope of the line. Where else would the slope of a tangent line be equal to that? Right there, somewhere, the tangent line would be about there, right? And right there, the tangent line would be about there, okay? If these lines are parallel, okay, then the average rate of change connecting these would equal the instantaneous rate of change. So wherever there's a hump, that hump is going to have a day, you know, a tangent line that hits it about there. That's going to be parallel. So the answer for this would be two. <laughs> <gasps> ooh, ooh, I thought there was three. I didn't even see that one. Jeez, Kyla, you are so smart. Three. Yeah, the bottom one is the average rate of change. And then wherever, wherever there's a hump. Yeah. Yep, a lower hump. Uh, what? Um, the interval goes from negative two to three here. You're gonna have an instantaneous rate of change somewhere that's parallel. So, yeah. You'll see a few questions kind of like this. Where is the second derivative smaller than the first derivative, which is smaller than the function value at that point? Okay, so this, you got to figure it's concave down. Because if it's the smallest, it's probably a negative number. This could be zero. Okay, so if the first derivative is zero, what is that? A maximum or a no, minimum? Isn't that? No. No, Liv. You're wrong. So we're thinking, we're probably saying this is probably a negative. This is probably zero. And this is probably positive. Because we, well, no. So, yeah, but just relax. We'll explain. So, the second derivative is smaller than the first derivative, which is smaller than the function. So, if you just in your mind say, yeah, well, if this is negative and this is zero and this is positive, that's true for this statement, okay? Because isn't a negative number smaller than zero, which is smaller than a positive number? Okay. So, is there a place where it's concave down because the second derivative being negative is concave down? It is at a maximum point because where the first derivative is equal to zero and it's concave down is the maximum point, right? And the point, maximum point is above the x-axis. C, concave down, a maximum point, so that's why this is zero, and 
Okay. Let's 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 do the. No, no, we're going to switch the order. That's what has just been being asked by Allie. And so let's say this, this, and I have no idea on this graph if this will work, but this. Okay, so what's the first derivative tell us? So a negative slope, Trey, negative slope. And then this, if this would be zero, it would be a point of inflection where it changes concavity. And then this is positive. So where on the graph do we have a negative slope, a point of inflection, but it happens at a positive number? Yeah. So it, it would have, no, it has to be a negative slope because the first derivative is, ne is the smallest number. So it has to be a negative slope. An, if this is zero, if this happens to be zero and this happens to be positive and this is negative, what? Because it's the middle number. Well, it is can if yeah, if it's positive, it's concavity. If it's negative, concavity. But if it's zero, that's where it changes concavity from positive to negative, which makes it a point of inflection. That's why this one is increasing or decreasing unless it's zero, and when it's zero, it's a max or a min. Okay. If it's positive, it's an increasing slope. If it's zero, it's a max or a min. If it's negative, it's a decreasing slope for the first derivative. Okay? There's no numbers. You got to really think through this. Um, because it's a, if it's concave down, it's a max. If it's concave up, it's a min. Don't worry, I got five. No, it doesn't. Okay, whoa, whoa, whoa. whoa. Oh, wait. Hey, hey, quit arguing. Okay. The function is just the graph positive, negative, positive, negative. That's the function. The y values of the graph is the function. The first derivative is slope, positive, negative, and where it's zero slope is a? No, slope. It's a maximum or minimum. Slopes, where the slope is zero is a maximum or minimum. Okay, second derivative is concavity. Concave up or concave down, but where the second derivative of zero, it's a? There you go. If the slope's zero. Okay, if slope is zero. If the slope is zero, it's probably not going to be a point of inflection. You know what? I get it now. We're going to go ahead and go. Trey, only time it can be a point of inflection is if the second derivative is zero. Okay. Up there. Where do we see a point of inflection for sure out of this graph? B is a point of inflection. You know, I wouldn't say D would be, but B is definitely a point of inflection. But, um, yeah, so for this, uh, I don't think we have that really happening on this graph. <sighs> okay. No, we're not wasting time. We've got a whole 90 minutes to be doing this stuff to get this down. But but having this having this discussion 
I think is helping people understand what's going on. Now, okay, let's do this one. Okay, negative slope, concave down, or it doesn't have to be, it doesn't have to be zero, Nate. It could be concave down and what if that's zero? What point did I just describe by saying we have a negative slope, it's concave down, and my point is zero? D. Okay, so it's like, are we set, I mean, I have the answer. Yeah. Because the value of the function is zero. Because the function is the y value of the graph. F of x is the y value of the graph. So this has a y value of zero. Right, I just told you it's zero. I'm. I'm leading you into this one, okay? No, I'm because I had to because the graph isn't set up right for this problem. I'm just saying, where is the function zero? It's concave down and a negative slope. And by me asking these three things, and I'm relating it to what's above, you can figure out that it was D. There will be less than. What? How would I be able to figure that out logically without the bottom? On this graph, you wouldn't really. I mean, you would have to really think through it. And I don't think they'll do something like that. I think it'll be straightforward like this one was. Okay? Trey. Okay, um, yeah, so if for A, A would be, F of X would be negative, and then the first derivative, and then the second derivative. That would be choice A. Because the A might be barely positive slope, but it's the concavity is quite concave up. So it doesn't change to zero to the other. So that would be A. So the second one is your, um, this is kind of the second one is concavity. Second one is concavity. And then what is that last one? Is that, is that last one. F of, F, F of two. This is concavity. What the, then what's the middle one? This is derivative. First derivative, that's slope. Oh, oh, yeah, I got it. First right. derivative is always slope. Second derivative is concavity. And F of X is always slope. Y value. So F of X is always the Y value. really got that. I got it. I got this. Okay. All right, here we go. Look at that, Nate Ricky all over this one. Quit talking about gymnastics and let's focus on this now. Yeah. But is she fully back? Oh. Uh, okay. Okay. All right, here we go. Somebody uh, going to, you know, do the... Uh, Nancy Kerrigan to her, the, oh, what was the guy, Tanya Harding's man friend that uh, went and took a baseball bat to her knee? Okay. 
Okay. What is this telling us? It's concave up. Okay. It's a minimum or maximum, but if the it's concave up, it has to be a minimum. Where is it a minimum and it's concave up? A. Because it's concave up. So concave up looks like this. So if you have a point that's zero slope, it has to be a minimum because the slope is zero. It's a min or a max. If it's concave up, it's a min. If it's concave down and the slope is zero, it's a max. If the slope is zero, it's a min or a max. If it's on top of the hill or on the bottom of it, because you're not moving, you can't right. slide anyone. Yeah, right. Yes, Dre? If D2Y over whatever the side is, greater than or equal to, or greater than sign of switch, would it be a concave down? Yes. Yes, and what if it said... If it said this, what letter would it be? C. 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 <coughs> How about this, people? What if... Don't shout it out. Wait, wait. Give everybody time. Enoch, what is it? It is B. Yes. And B would be this way, right? Because the slope is not zero. Because the slope is going up. Because it has a positive slope. And it's a point of inflection where it changes concavity. <coughs> okay, where is this function decreasing? Find the first derivative. Where, what is the first derivative of this function? Set the first derivative equal to zero. Six is a what? Number. What kind of a number? Positive. What's the specific thing we we say about this when the first derivative is equal to zero? It's a something number. Critical number. It's a critical number. Now, that doesn't tell where we're increasing or decreasing. So how do we tell where it's increasing or decreasing? We look at numbers on each side of it. Very good, Bella. So if we look at five, if we put five into the first derivative, find the first derivative of five, we get negative one. If we put the first derivative of seven, we get one. So from negative infinity to six, it's decreasing. From negative infinity to six, it's decreasing. And then from six on, it has a positive slope. 
Uh, yeah, sure. I'm I'm recording it, so. Okay. Now be careful on this one. How many mins and maxes does the function have if the first derivative is represented by the graph below? Shh. Just think first before you start shouting out answers. How many mins and maxes, and these would be relative mins and maxes, not absolute mins and maxes, if this is the first derivative of the function. Is. Oh, that's an is? Okay. That's a word, is. The first derivative is represented by the graph below. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Liv, you got an answer for us? Lives as three. I agree. Yeah, I agree. What would this first point be? A min or a max? A minimum. Yeah. Oh, it's going down. It's, it's a max. Ooh, we have people disagreeing on this. I love the discussions in here. Okay, do we have a consensus on this? What is this? It's a minimum because it goes from negative slope to positive slope. So it's a minimum point right there. What is this one? It's a maximum because it goes from positive slope to negative slope. It's a maximum. What about this one? Is this a min or a max right here? This is a minimum again because it goes from negative slope to positive slope. Okay. Some points of this test, yes. Yes, during some questions of this test, yes. I'm not going over every one of the 26 questions. I'm generalizing a lot of the questions with these. Oh, yeah. I will go through questions very similar to the optimization questions on the test. Very similar. Oh, well, I'll change up the words a little bit. The shape will be the same. Okay. Okay, uh, let's find the absolute max and absolute min of the following function within this interval. How do we find the ma absolute max, absolute min? Find the critical numbers. All right, so find the first derivative to find the critical numbers, right, Bella? So the first derivative is? And set it equal to zero. And then what do we do? Solve it how? Factor out 3x. And we get? X plus four equals zero. So X equals zero and X equals negative four. Are both of these within this interval? No, this is a not within the interval, so we don't worry about that one. So we test three numbers. We're gonna find F of negative one, F of zero, and F 
of 3. In the original equation, not the first derivative, in the original equation. Breezy. Uh, the other one. We've covered like 12 questions. What's the other one? Where you're finding the decrease, but it's not the absolute. Then it's just a. I don't even know my question. I don't even know your question either, so that's why. Okay. Could you? I don't think so. He's asking, you know, oh. like we found the critical number, but there was only like the one, but they didn't give you these. You had to pick well, the number was six, you picked five and seven. Yeah. It's the same thing you're doing. Five That's five. definitely not mean value theorem, but no, yeah. But no, we're not. This is this is quite different than that. We're finding where it was increasing or decreasing there. We want to find the actual y value. We want to actually find the y value to find the absolute min or max. Okay, what's f of negative one if we stick negative one in here? What? You mental. Minus six. Minus six. What's negative one squared? There we go, nineteen. Okay, what's zero? 14. What's three? 95? I'll trust you. Okay. No, 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 no. Within... Within this, you could, you have to have a minimum and you have to have a maximum. Within a range, you there's going to be a min, there's going to be a max. Now, they might be the same thing if it's a horizontal line, but we're not going to do that on the test. What? The absolute max is the point 395. That's the ordered pair. 395 is the absolute max. What is the maximum value? 95. Where does the maximum occur? At x equals 3. Okay. Could be any question similar to that. Okay. What is the minimum value? 14. So the minimum occurs at the point 0, 14. The minimum value is 14. It occurs at x equals 0. Okay, so absolute maxes and mins. Yeah, you could graph it and then just find where it is. <sighs> okay, this one is a little different. We haven't seen. Sal can didn't throw something like this at us, but AP does, so we need to know what to do here. What are the critical numbers and the points of inflection of f of x if the graph of f prime of x is shown? So the first derivative graph is shown. So Okay. So, now, this is the first derivative given to us. The first derivative tells us what? The slope. Okay, yes. The inflection points is what we're, we're looking for. Or wait, I guess mins and maxes and inflection points, all of them, yes. Okay, so let's look at the critical numbers first. Critical numbers are what? Critical, yes, Bella. Mins and maxes are critical numbers, okay? So where 
where the graph crosses the x axis are your critical numbers in this case. Zero and three are our critical numbers. Okay. Now, points of inflection. Okay. Points of inflection here is when I, I want to explain this the easiest way possible. So when your first derivative changes from an increasing slope to a decreasing slope, where the maximum or minimum occurs on the first derivative graph, that's where your points of inflection will be. So where are your points of inflection in this case? Two and four X values. Yeah. An X value of two, there's going to be a point of inflection. And an X value of four, there's going to be a point of inflection. Because if you're going to look at the actual graph, there's going to be a change in concavity there. Okay? Because it goes from a negative slope to a positive slope. Okay, and if you think through all three graphs and you go backwards, okay, that's where the concavity will change. Okay. Because if you think about a regular function, let's go over here once. If you think about a normal function, if I would graph something like this and this and this, this is f of x, okay? Trey, let's pay attention to this now. Okay. If this is the normal function graph, what is this called? A maximum. a maximum. So the first derivative of a maximum point would be right here. What is this point down here called? Minimum. minimum. The first derivative would be there. Okay. So what's happening is the slope is increasing till this point, decreasing till this point, and increasing, right? So the first derivative function would look like this. Do you get that? Okay, because the original function is increasing slope, so the first derivative has to be positive. Where the original function has a negative slope, the first derivative has to be negative. And where we, again, have positive slope, the first derivative is positive. So see where this happens, okay? Where the min and max happens, the first derivative crosses zero. Now, watch what happens next, okay? Let's go with a different color now. So we get this. That's what the second derivative would possibly look like, okay? The second derivative, the point of inflection where it kind of changes from concave down to concave up is about right here, which is the same place where this has the minimum. So these three points are all lined up vertically from each other, okay? So where... On the original graph, they have a point of inflection. A minimum will occur on the first derivative and will cross the x-axis on the second derivative. See how all three graphs relate to each other, okay? That section where we were relating graphs, two, three, one, one, two, three, and so on, that's what you were kind of supposed to get out of that. 
but they didn't lay the graphs on top of each other. They separated them so you could see what was going on. But if they would lay them on top of each other, that's what it would look like in certain cases. Okay? All right. So that's putting together first derivative, second derivative, and original function. Okay? All right. If this is the second derivative, if this is the second derivative, where are we concave up? Where are we concave down? If this is the graph of the second derivative, where are we concave up? Where are we concave down? What's one region where we're concave up? No. You're just thinking of this being a normal function. This is the graph of the second derivative. I'm guessing it would be zero, two. Zero to two, it's concave up. There's another area where it's concave up as well, the very beginning. So from negative infinity to negative 2, it's concave up. Where is it concave down? Negative 2 to 0. Negative 2 to 0 and 2 to infinity. How do you figure, asked Liv, and I want you to know, to explain, how do you figure that out? No, it's not the opposite. Enoch, how'd you figure it out? Um, less, I can explain that I'm on the spot, right? But <laughs> it's positive, so it's going to be concave. Yeah, wherever it's positive, wherever the second derivative is positive, it's concave up. Wherever the second derivative is negative, it's concave down. Because when it is at zero, it is it, an inflection. It's an inflection point, exactly. Anytime the second derivative is at zero, it changes concavity. Or it wouldn't have to. No, no, positive, negative is the easiest way to explain it. Where, where it's positive, it's concave up. Where it's negative, it's concave down for the second derivative. Okay? When you said points at zero are an inflection point? Yeah, where it crosses the x-axis is an inflection point. Ooh, this one. This one, yeah, we'll freeze. I'll stop the recording, so we'll have two different recordings, and we'll do this one after lunch, but this one's a fun one. Can we just, like, graph it? We don't want to graph it. I just want you to look and see what the first derivative and second derivative are telling us about the graph. <coughs> Where is it concave up? Where is it concave down? Where is it increasing slope? Where is it decreasing slope? Do we have a min? Do we have a max? Do we have a point of inflection? What's going on? That's going to be the first question after lunch.